Okay, so this is AP Bio Chapter 11. We are talking about self-communication, and we are using the red AP Biology book that's available for the classroom for this chapter only. The reason is, is that the cell communication component in this chapter um, is really well done in the red book, whereas in the green book, it's spaced out over several chapters. So when we talk about cell communication, we're talking about cells communicate, and it's absolutely essential for multicellular organisms. Our toe cells of humans need to be able to communicate to our brain that, in fact, we're moving, or maybe we've stepped on a sharp rock. That communication can only happen if our cells are talking to each other. Um, one of the big thing that's been happening is that biologists have discovered that there's some universal mechanisms for how cells kind of regulate and communicate. And it doesn't matter if this is in bacteria or amoeba or chimpanzee cells, all cells are doing this. And so it's kind of a been big research industry. Um, so let's talk about some of the major kind of communication that happens for yeast cells. Yeast cells are eukaryotic organisms. They're single-celled. They actually have external signals that can, is converted into a response within inside the cell. So if you look at the figures here, you'll see that what's talking about is the exchange of mating factors. So each cell, the purple A and the pink alpha, um, each one is secreting a mating factor, which is more than likely a protein. And that mating factor is going to bind into a receptor on a nearby cell. Once it has bound to the receptors on the nearby cell, so the alpha binding on the A, the A factor binding to the alpha, what happens is it induces them to mate or to merge together. So their cytoplasms, their cell walls match up, and then eventually their nuclei match up. Once the nucleuses have fused together, then we are actually creating an entire organism that has a combination of the two different DNAs. This is called a signal transduction pathway. A signal transduction pathway converts a signal on the cell's surface into a response within the cell. And that kind of pathway is similar in both prokaryotic, so bacterial cells, and eukaryotic cells indicating that it probably evolved very early on in evolutionary history. Now, the signal transduction pathways do not necessarily mean that the signal entered the cell. It could simply have stopped at the external membrane of the cell and then induced a change inside of the cell that leads to some changes. So let's look at some examples of a signal transduction pathway. So there's two types of communication that happens with cells. There's local and then there's long distance. Multicellular organisms need to communicate both to their neighbors, cell to cell, but they also need to communicate over huge distances. As I said, a toe cell needs to be able to communicate to a brain cell. And so how do we do that? If we're using local communication, we're going to be communicating through those gap junctions, those connections between the cytoplasms through the cell membrane of two neighboring cells. Long distance, we're going to be talking about things like hormones or those type of so here's an example of the gap junction. You can see here in these arrows that these cells are directly connected to one another. There is holes within the cell membranes. Their cytoplasm is freely able to exchange material. So you can see here that one cell is exchanging material to the other cell. This cell is exchanging material to this cell. That's the gap junction. Plant cells do not have that. They also have gap junctions, but because they have a cell wall to deal with, they have a new vocabulary term. We call that plasmodesmata. So you can see here in this plant cell, here's our cell wall. The cell wall is perforated, the cell membranes are fused, and we have those internal gap junctions. But again, because we're in a plant cell, and we're not only going through the membrane, but we're going through the cell wall, we call, call it a plasmodesmata. Now, some local signaling can happen through direct contact. So it's not just through openings within the cell membrane. When cells communicate through direct contact, what's usually happening is you have a protein on one cell binding to a receptor on the membrane of another cell. And then that, in turn, does the signal transduction pathway, and we trigger a response inside of this cell. So again, we're not having a sharing of the membrane like we would in a gap junction. Rather, we have a protein and a receptor. Now, there are some other examples that happen. Um, some animal cells use what are called local regulators. And local regulators are basically 
vesicles or proteins that are inside of a membrane so they can act as kind of a mobile cell. So here's an example of a pancreas cell. And so what happens is this cell is secreting out a signal within a vesicle and it's allowing it to diffuse through the extracellular matrix. Remember, cells are surrounded by water, so there is mobility in there. So these molecules are traveling across the distance until they bind to a nearby target cell. Um, and when that happens, that target cell has received the signal, it now can do its job. One of the best examples is um, the paracrine cells. They'll secrete a signal that then tells another cell to make a growth factor, to make a signal that says we need to start dividing. Another example is syn synapses are part of our nervous system. So what happens is our nerve signal secretes a signal. That signal is a tangible molecule. It will travel again across the extracellular matrix through the watery environment until it binds to a receptor on our target cell. The target cell then responds. Now, long distance signaling both plants and animals use hormones. There's no need for long distance signaling inside of a single celled organism, and that should be logical because single celled organisms only need to communicate within their own cell wall, whereas both plants and animals need to have a distance to travel. So for example, an endocrine cell will secrete a hormone, that hormone enters our blood vessels, it travels around our bloodstream until it's received at its target cell. Now, how do we do cell signaling? There are three major stages of cell signaling, and they were actually discovered by a researcher called Ur Sutherland, um, and he was actually working with the hormone epinephrine and how it acts on cells. So Sutherland suggested three major signals that go out in the process of cell signaling. One, you have to have reception, so you have to receive the signal. Then you have to have transduction, and that's where the signal gets transduced. And by that, I mean it gets transferred. And then you're going to have the response, where the target cell actually will make a response based on the signal it had. Now, let's do an overview. So here's what happens in cell signaling. The signal comes in, and it binds to the target receptor here. And this target receptor is when the first step is done, and that's called reception. Then what's going to happen is that reception or that target receptor is going to transduce the signal and it's going to activate relay molecules inside the cytoplasm of the cell as a way of saying, hey, this is our signal, now we can go do our job. And then the last job that happens is we need some sort of response. Oftentimes the response that happens is we're going to start making proteins. 